Okay, there we go. Um, thanks very much, Tim, for your introduction. Um, so I welcome the opportunity to talk to you today around the question of sort of what next for the EU. Uh, I'd also thank Kes for arranging or, or responding positively to the idea that we have something focused on Brexit early on in the Kes seminar. Um, series. Um, delighted that a good number of colleagues from Queen's have been able to come up here today and present um, to you. Um, the focus of what I'm looking at is um, the limits and opportunities for a new relationship with the EU. Um, so I'm shifting the focus slightly and um, looking at opportunities more from, a, from a, an EU perspective, partly reflects the fact that uh, my research interests have always been in the EU's external relations and the type of relationships that it's willing to establish and indeed has established with non-member states. Um, I think this is obviously important because it feeds into um, discussions about what next for the UK as a whole. But within that also, I think it can provide insights into what, we, what might be possible um, in the context of what I'll come to as a, a bespoke arrangement um, which could accommodate some of the elasticity which um, uh, Katie has been talking about with particular reference to Northern Ireland. Um, I think a number of things I want to do First of all, is highlight some of the challenges for Northern Ireland, at least the challenges which are informing some of the thinking I'm doing about what might be possible. Um, then look at what the opportunities are for the UK to actually pursue a bespoke arrangement with the, e, with the, EU, for the UK with the EU. Um, I think if we... Well, it's very difficult to work out exactly what the British government is aiming for in the context of a future relationship with the EU. But more recently, there have been various statements um, by government uh, ministers uh, and officials that it's looking for something particularly designed for the UK. Um, I want to look at whether that's really possible. And to do that, I wanted to look at some of the principles and practice which have informed EU um, external relations since its creation back in the 1950s and highlight a number of particular principles which, to my mind at least, suggest that there's limited scope for the UK as a whole to get something particularly bespoke which differs radically from what has been off on offer to other states more recently. Then I want to have a look, quick look at okay, well, how those different types of relationship may begin to accommodate um, some of the particular challenges which Northern Ireland faces before they're moving to see whether there is within any particular relationship the opportunity for a bespoke arrangement for a particular geographical entity, in this case Northern Ireland. Okay. We've already heard that there are clearly a number of challenges facing, the, facing Northern Ireland in the context of Brexit. Um, a number of them are very pragmatic, a number of them are political, and many of them are very sensitive. Many of them have significant economic implications. Um, one which I don't think we've actually heard today um, is this one, respecting the vote. I think we've got to be aware of the political context in which we operate, where we do have quite a vocal um, set of uh, individuals and groups arguing that the 56% vote needs to be respected. Hence the two court cases which are ongoing. And I think it's fair to say that those court cases will probably not be the last, assuming they're not successful. There is that context there. Um, a key challenge also is around, obviously, the border. Um, and as the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, indicated in their August letter, they maintain that the border will not become an impediment to the movement of people, goods and services. Delivering on that is going to be a major challenge for Northern Ireland and also the UK if it's willing to subscribe to it, as suggested in some of the language, at least, of ministers, it is. Okay. We have, Katie has mentioned also, common travel area, um, some views of an extremely hard Brexit would beg serious questions as to whether many of the elements, if not all the elements of the CTA, could actually be sustained post-Brexit. I'm not saying that's where we're going to end up, but I think there is a challenge there of actually maintaining the, the CTA in any arrangement. And as we know from at least one of the court cases, there's questions about the Belfast Good Friday Agreement being, um, uh, being possible to wholly maintain all of that in, in a post-Brexit environment. Um, we've also had today a whole variety of sectoral um, challenges. Um, I think it's fair to say that actually the detail of all the challenges has yet to really be unpicked. 
we're a long way from really understanding all the challenges that um, face us um, as we as the UK moves towards um, leaving the EU. So there's a very particular context for Northern Ireland which um, is reflected in these and indeed other challenges. Okay, so my question then is, can Northern Ireland's interests be accommodated within a new UK-EU relationship? Um, arguably, if there were an exceptionally soft Brexit, I think it's possible, as I'll indicate later, that a significant number of these challenges could be addressed because a significantly soft Brexit would not be too different from the status quo, except that the UK would be outside of EU decision-making um, um, bodies. Um, now, given the rhetoric of the Tory party leadership, the, the Prime Minister um, and many of her ministers, particularly in recent weeks, I think the likelihood of a soft Brexit is exceedingly slim indeed. The language and the direction of, of the rhetoric has been very much towards a hard Brexit. Uh, I might argue there's a bit of moderation in the last couple of days, but um, the hard Brexit seems to be the most likely outcome. Now, I think in that context, very few of the challenges I highlighted can really be accommodated unless we move towards something bespoke, particularly for, for Northern Ireland. Okay. I'd also argue that... Um, the prospects for a bespoke relationship with the e for the UK with the EU are constrained significantly by the EU principles which it has established over time. If you look at the suite of external relations which the EU has established um, since its creation, um, then we can identify three key principles. Um, the first is that the EU always prioritises its own internal integration. Okay. I think it's something worth remembering in the context of Brexit and the negotiations, is whereas the debate within the UK, possibly Ireland as well, really sees Brexit as the big issue on the EU's agenda. If you're looking from Brussels outwards, it's number six or seven on the list of priorities. The EU is concerned with a whole variety of different challenges, of which... One is Brexit. And it was pointed out to me yesterday, if you go back to Jean-Claude Juncker's State of the Union speech, um, I think he had 12 priorities for the Commission, at least, over the coming years. Not one of them was Brexit. A separate statement was issued about Brexit. Now, there's reason, there's political reasons for that, but he wasn't necessarily stating Brexit as the number one. And if you look at successive European Council uh, or, or, or the conclusions or, or, or statements issued after the 27th of May recently, Brexit is one of many. Okay. That fits in, I think, to this idea of the principle that the EU will look after its own inter internal interests before it really dedicates time and energy to, to the ex external. So Brexit is not number one on the agenda. Secondly, it's going to safeguard its own decision-making autonomy. I think it's been interesting that the UK, in any of the discussions around bespokeness, um, has not been talking about engagement in institutions. I'm not too sure this is, this is particularly uh, important in the context of current discussions. The more important principle is this one, and that is any relationship which the EU establishes with a non-member state must be based on a balance of benefits and obligations. This is the principle which underpins a lot of the discourse we've seen over the summer about no non-member state being able to cherry-pick. There is no pick-and-choose there has to be a balance of rights and obligations. I'd actually argue there is essentially an imbalance of rights and obligations in the favour of the European Union, because the power dynamic comes out. I know there's a number of um, ardent Brexiteers um, who believe that uh, the trade situation between the UK and the EU means to say the UK will have considerable leverage. It, 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 the UK will have considerable leverage in the negotiations. But I think when you actually look at the percentage of um, EU trade accounted for by the UK, it's much, much lower than any sense that the UK might have a, a, a heavy influence over the terms of trade we would suggest. Okay. The EU's insistence on these principles um, has been reflected in a whole variety of relationships which is, it has established since it, its creation. Um, and we, we can see it in a whole variety of different types of arrangement, many of which will be familiar to you because of the discussions which have been had during the context of the referendum and also since. Okay, we have a European economic area, which is essentially the four freedoms, 
plus a whole series of um, flanking policies, um, plus commitments to, to funding a number of, of policies within the, the, uh, in and around the European Union. We have a strong focus on um, the, uh, in terms of the customs union, the Turkish example, the fifth one down there, whereby in exchange for access to free market, access to the, to, the, the, to the market for goods, Turkey assumes the external tariff and also the common commercial policy of the European Union. Okay. If you look at the Canadian relationship uh, with, with the EU, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, which they're talking about potentially initially, if not signing um, in the coming weeks, a um, huge number of obligations being taken on by, by Canada in exchange for a comprehensive trade agreement with, with the e EU. Okay. Now, within these, um, we have to begin to think the extent to which they would actually accommodate the Northern Ireland challenges, which I, which I mentioned. I mentioned earlier that I think if you go for the UK goes for a very soft Brexit, much, many of the challenges can be accommodated. If the UK were to stay in, were to enter the European economic area, then free movement of people issues around the border would effectively be um, uh, accommodated. Um, free trade would be accommodated with one significant exception. It doesn't cover agricultural goods, which then raises the issue of the customs control arrangements around agriculture as well. So even if there was the, the, the softest Brexit with the economic area, then, that, then agriculture, um, there would be issues to address around agriculture. Um, okay. The Swiss bilateralism, um, limited engagement on agricultural goods. There is no free movement of services there, or it's not complete. Um, it's also a very static arrangement. Um, the customs union with Turkey, yes, that provides free movement of industrial goods. It doesn't cover agriculture. It doesn't include the other free movements as well. Turkey is still trying to seek visa-free travel with the EU. Okay, so each of these agreements, um, I could go into the detail of, of the others, addresses in some respects um, some of the challenges which Northern Ireland faces, um, but none of them would it sufficient, is sufficiently broad and comprehensive to address all the challenges which I think we face here. Okay. I think it's also worth reminding ourselves of what essentially is a consistent line coming out of Brussels and the other member states, that as far as the EU is concerned, that balance of rights and obligations I mentioned earlier, the benefit, balance of benefits and obligations, really revolves around the four freedoms, that you cannot have access to free movement of goods, services and capital without free movement of people. Now, one could argue that works in favour of Northern Ireland, but in terms of the UK government's position, when anti or immigrate, concerns about immigration seem to be a key driver of its response to the referendum outcome, it's clear that the access to the market for goods, services and capital is not going to be coming um, it's not going to be made available unless there is um, engagement on the free movement of people by the British government. Okay, so central argument is that I can't see um, a bespoke arrangement being made available to the UK, which significantly differs from what has already been available. The problem there for us in Northern Ireland is that none of those agreements really address all the concerns that we have. And if the emphasis is going to be on something like more of a hard Brexit, so probably more towards... Uh, a free trade agreement with some economic and political co cooperation, um, then within that arrangement, something will bespoke for Northern Ireland will have to be put in place if those challenges, which I mentioned earlier, plus others, can be sufficiently addressed. Okay. So what are the options, not for a bespoke arrangement for the UK, but within the UK-EU relationship for some sort of bespoke status for Northern Ireland? All right. Um, before looking at some of the, what might be practical in a, within the context of a, of a post-Brexit agreement, we should not ig ignore, at least because it may help inform some thinking about what opportunities might be available, this idea of the reverse Greenland, or as a colleague um, Brendan O'Leary has written about in Dalriada option, which is essentially UK, Scotland remaining inside the UK, inside the EU as the UK, um, and essentially 
England and Wales leaving. We'll talk more about that later. Um, uh, chances of that happening are not, I wouldn't say particularly great. Uh, okay, I think we're going to be more faced with the issue of how to accommodate Northern Ireland within the context of a uh, post-Brexit UK-EU EU relationship. Um, the border is obviously a key issue. And my argument would be, if we're to address the particular concerns that Northern Ireland faces, we have to think probably quite radically about what the options are. Uh, colleague Cahill McCall has written on the idea of essentially bordering Britain um, and that being one way forward of addressing the concerns we have here about the imposition of a hard border. Much of the discussion there has been around the movement of people. I'd also I'd argue that if you went for the hard border Britain um, arg, uh, option, that would also possibly facilitate or create space in which you could address the free trade issue and particularly around agriculture as well because just as you might put the um, border for a movement of people in the Irish Sea, you would also, could also put the customs border in there as well. And you might have a situation where the, the UK leaves the EU, but Northern Ireland remains within the customs union because that's possible geographically if the border were to move into the Irish Sea. I wouldn't say I'm advocating that position, but I think it's one way in which the a radical solution could address other issues. It could also possibly facilitate Northern Ireland, whether this is appropriate or not, given what Vivienne was saying earlier, and Lee was saying earlier, to stay within the, within the common agricultural policy. Okay. Um, all right. I think the reason, one of the reasons I'd argue that the bespoke status for Northern Ireland is possible is if you actually look at the relationships which the EU has established with non-member states and you also look at the level of internal integration, we can begin to identify a whole series of precedents for differentiation. That the EU actually, when faced with problems or challenges um, relating to geographical entities, can often come up with um, levels of differentiation which can, which can um, be fairly accommodating. We've got examples of what we might for, refer to as extraterritorial differentiation. In terms of the EU's relationship under the European Economic Area, Liechtenstein operates a particular, uh, has a particular set, set of arrangements around free movement of people in particular. Um, there is differentiation there. There's also a number of bespoke regional arrangements which the EU has as part of its external relations. The position of Svalbard in relation to Norway in particular. Um, there's also the position of uh, Kaliningrad in the case of Russia's relations. It's not necessarily the model you'd want to follow, but the point is that there, are, there is differentiation there, which highlights the, the idea that there is precedent um, for an alternative geographically specific arrangement within an external relationship of the European Union. What we also have is within the EU precedents for differentiation as well. If you look at the situation of the Oland Islands off of um, Finland, they have a particular relationship within the EU, as do the Faroe Islands as well. Relationships which can be created because of their geographical location. And I think if we look at the Northern Ireland context, yes, there are political constitutional issues around, but a lot of the challenges flow from our geography and the fact that post-Brexit we, we will have the border with the, the rest of the, the EU. Um, and there's also precedents around for um, differentiation at the borders of the EU. You only have to look back to the Cold War period and the way in which Germany was able to engage with East Germany, or West Germany was able to engage with East Germany. Um, in a particular way, which deviated from some of the norms of the rest of the EU. So my point is, there's scope there for bespokeness. There's scope there for, uh, or there's precedence there for differentiation, which may be able to address some of the issues or the need around elasticity, which was mentioned earlier. Um, the challenge for us, or well, challenge for Northern Ireland, however, is working out what we need. Um, the priorities of Northern Ireland need to be identified. Um, there needs to be clarity around what the issues are. There needs to be a prioritisation of, of issues. Uh, and this comes back to the question of capacity, which has already been touched on. Do we have that capacity? Do we also have the mechanisms available? 
There then needs to be, to my mind, some serious thinking about how can those priorities be accommodated within the withdrawal arrangements and within the new UK-EU relationship. The problem or the big challenge there is we simply do not know what shape that UK-EU relationship is likely to take, partly because the preferences of the British government seem to be, well, unstable to say the least. Okay, it's very difficult to work out what is possible if you don't have a clear sense as to what the context is in which you're operating. Okay. What I then think we need to be doing is identifying what options there might be for bespoke arrangements. How do you, how do you draw on that opportunity for bespokeness, which I'd argue is there because of precedence, um, to create arrangements which address the challenges which Northern Ireland faces, whether they be the political, whether they be around the border, whether they be in particular policy areas? Um, what options are there available? The question also is, who's going to do that? Um, I think the huge onus is on Northern Ireland to be thinking this through. Partly because we're not particularly... The UK is not particularly high up on the agenda of the EU in terms of Brexit negotiations. Northern Ireland, yes, features in terms of the UK government's priorities and issues of concern, but equally the capacity of London to address everything, particularly in a relatively short time span, is such that its capacity to really think through the Northern Ireland issues is probably quite limited. I think it, a lot of the thinking needs to be coming from us locally here. And uh, then final point is thinking creatively, thinking about what sort of solutions may solve some of the or address some of the challenges we, we face. We may want to pick up on some ideas, um, which I know have come out of Katie's work last week, and some of the ideas which um, at least I've been aware of people discussing. Major challenge there, but I'd argue there's some scope at least for some bespokeness um, in a post-Brexit arrangement for Northern Ireland, in which the challenges I highlighted earlier and other colleagues have picked up on could possibly be addressed. Thank you very much.